So I want to talk first about the big numbers. And these really are the numbers that Main Street every year on a cumulative basis has kind of collected, gathered, distributed to you, to the legislature, to the governor, to the Main Street community, to the media and others. And one of these is the cumulative job, net job growth. Just like the businesses, what they count every month, send in, we had a, a, a business that added three people, but we had another business that got rid of two people, so our net job growth was one person. Or a new business moved in and they had four employees. That's net job growth. So these are net numbers. And over the 26 years, that has meant in those Main Street communities, well over 11,000 net new jobs in those communities have been created over the years in Main Street. Big, big numbers. The corresponding number is the number of net new businesses created over that time. Um, and again, these are numbers that you know, Tom and, and, and Michael and their staff put out every year, and it's been about 3,800 net new businesses over this time period in the Main Street communities. Uh, they also measure how much people spend buying buildings in these Main Street communities and how much they spend rehabilitating these buildings in these communities. And just so there's no misunderstanding, this is a, a wide range of things. So somebody spends $6,000 fixing up their facade, that's included. Somebody spends a million and a half dollars redoing the whole building, that's included. But it's this physical investment in the building itself. And over that 26 year period, over a billion, a billion with a B, billion dollars has been invested in, the, in buying and rehabilitating those buildings in Main Street communities. And of course, some of that comes from you know, big city projects in, in Dubuque and Ames and elsewhere. I mean, yeah, a little over half of it. But every level of these communities have seen sizable investments in their communities. See, little towns under 5,000 people have seen $126 million worth of investment in people buying and rehabbing buildings. So that is how this kind of Main Street economic impact is spread, big places, little places. <coughs>
in 27 years of Main Street where there are fewer businesses at the end of the year than there were at the beginning of the year. Every year there was net growth in new businesses. Here we looked at that in comparing to the United States. And what you can see in the, in the, red, in the red bars going below zero, four years out of that 26 years, in fact, in the whole United States, there were fewer businesses. The business, numbers of businesses shrunk because of bad economies. Every year, the number of businesses in Main Street communities grew. In fact, except for the one, uh, one almost negligible example uh, here, where this is the U.S. rate of growth, here's in Main Street. Not only did they have great more net businesses every year, every year but one, their rate of new business creation was greater than it was in the whole U.S. economy. So you're not tied to the ups and downs of the U.S. economy. They're making a decided difference because of, of the environment that they're creating. Well, much of Main Street is trying to, you know, beg, twist arms, plead for people to buy buildings and fix them. It's a big component because that's the, the biggest private asset in Main Street are the, those buildings that are down the street. And here is the number of the cumulative investment in, uh, in the uh, rehabilitation of those buildings. And you can see it's a, it's a growing curve, it's, but it's not growing straight line, it's growing accumulatively uh, as it goes forward. Where it, again, a, a bunch of it comes from the urban areas, but uh, all of the components are adding significantly to the growth. Here is the numbers of amount that people have spent buying the buildings. And again, cumulatively over time. And between those two, between those two, again, it's over $1.1 billion, billion dollars in acquisition and rehabilitation of those buildings. But I wanted to take a look at slightly different. <coughs> so I took two time periods. I took the decade of the 90s, and I took the decade since 2000 and said, what was the average sales price of buildings in all the Main Street communities over that time? The average sale price for buildings in the 90s in all the Main Street communities, uh, $60,000. Now, some of them sold for $5,000, some of them sold for a million, but that's the average purchase price over that 10-year period. In the decade since the 20s, or since the 2000s, and remember now in four or five of those who've been in a real estate depression, the average sales price was 150, it was three times as much, 155,000. Way beyond kind of statistical accident. Now, we also had in the first half of the 2000, a kind of real estate craziness boom, but this kind of lumping them together kind of wipes out that weird volatility. It's a huge difference. But the potential criticism there is, okay, you can put these things up, but you know, a place like the Butte where they're, you know, spending millions of dollars to house IBM, that's going to distort those numbers. Well, maybe. So I said, let's just take that out. Let's just look at what this number is just for the little towns, just for the places under 5,000 people. And here's the, here's the answer. That in the 90s, the average sales price of a building in those smaller towns, $40,000. In, in the 2000, 130000 now, uh, Tim Reinders pointed out when I made this presentation this morning, saying, well, look at what else you kind of missed there, as in fact this rate of change is in fact greater in the smaller towns than it is for the towns, Main Street towns uh, uh, in a composite. Here's what this means, and I know we have plenty of bankers in the, in the groups so who can either reinforce or give me a different perspective. Real estate is, real estate purchases are one of the strongest indicators of the confidence into the future because it's a long-term asset. That if you're buying it, you're going to have to hold on to it for a while to make any money. And so this extraordinary difference in purchase price is a great indicator of increasing confidence. There's still going to be a downtown here or a real estate market here, you know, in three or five or seven or 15 years from now. I think a great indicator. But now here, this is only for those of you who are statistics geeks, and for the rest of you all apologize. <laughs> Two things that are happening that they're taking, keeping track of. One of them is people are buying buildings. The second is that people are spending money rehabilitating buildings. But the second one is really more important indicator of the confidence of the private sector to the future, economic future of the community. Here's why. 
If I'm in one of these little towns and you have a building for sale and you're desperate to sell it, I might say, I'll buy it if I can buy it cheap enough and hope I can take in enough rent to pay the property tax and the insurance. I'll hope things get better. And maybe not even put any money into it. I kind of do it. And furthermore, you know, if you're anxious enough to sell, I'm going to say, yeah, I'll buy it, but I'll give you 10% down and you carry the balance on the contract. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but that's how, you know, that's how purchasing a building in lots of these small towns would simply be done in, in weak markets. When you're talking about rehabilitation dollars, however, the seller's not going to finance my rehabilitation. I'm going to have to go to the bank. The bank's going to want out not only my credit report, but they're going to want to appraisal the property, and the bank is going to have to look after the bank's deposits, saying, do we think this is a, an investment or we're going to get our money back? So I made this calculation about the ratio between what's being spent on acquisition and what's being spent on rehabilitation. And at the beginning of the period, they really weren't that far apart. That people weren't spending much more rehabilitating buildings than they were buying them. Now this is not building for building. It's not that you, every instance it's, I bought this building then rehab. It's kind of lumping stuff together. Here's all the buildings that were bought, all the money spent on rehab, what's the ratio? But the point is that about 45% of all the money was spent buying, 55% fixing up. But look at how that has changed over time. Not only has the, what this doesn't show you is that the purchase prices you just saw, the purchase prices are three times as much as they were a decade and a half ago. But even given that, the percentage that goes to rehabilitation is decidedly greater as a percentage of that whole investment than it was in the early years. That is an extraordinary statement of confidence of the people who are buying the buildings, who are rehabilitating the buildings, to the bankers who are lending the money to, to do both about the future of that long-term asset. You can't, you can't invest in an asset like that and say, well, I'll get my money back you know, next week. You're not going to. It's going to be you know, six years from now. And that is the confidence that these programs have created in the economic future for those communities. One of the measurements that has not done, been done before, and that is, OK, we've got people fixing up buildings. What does that mean in terms of jobs? So we bought, for the purpose of this uh, survey, a, a, a econometric model that is used uh, by economic development people all over the country. It's called Implan. And this is a giant economic model that looks at, I don't know, 550 or 60 kinds of, of uh, business categories. Everything you can think of, from being a lawyer to growing oats to manufacturing automobiles, everything you can think of has a category. And then by output, it measures what that means in terms of numbers of jobs created and amount of household income created. Now, output, if I'm in the automobile manufacturing, automo you know, it's how, how much does manufacturing a million dollars of automobiles mean in terms of job creation? If I'm a lawyer, it's how many, when I write a million dollars worth of wills and divorce papers, how many jobs that create? If I'm in the McDonald's business, you know, if I sell a million dollars worth of hamburgers, what does that mean? Well, in construction, the output is what's that expenditure to build new or to rehabilitate? So we took the expenditure and the rehabilitation over the lifetime of, of Main Street, and that has created an average of 623 jobs every year over the whole lifetime of the program. Now, you'll notice it says direct jobs and indirect, and just for those of you who care about the geekiness stuff, here's the difference. Is that Okay, I'm rehabilitating a building and I hire a plumber and a carpenter, an electrician and a painter. Those are direct jobs they are working on that project in the building. But that's not where the job creation stops. Because in order to build that building, i got to go to the lumber yard and buy two-by-fours. And there's a guy working at the lumber yard selling me those, so that's part of a job creation. That's what it is different between a direct and indirect job. But they're all real jobs in virtually any economic development you know, calculation uh, considers them both. So 623 jobs a year for you know, 27 years, but in the last decade, over a thousand jobs a year from that rehabilitation uh, work in those communities. And once again, it's not the whole town. It's in the Main Street district of that town. So if Clinton, Iowa builds a you know, new building out by the airport, that didn't count. That's not in these numbers. That wasn't in the Main Street district. This is only the activity in that Main Street district. But those people with those jobs, they also get a paycheck. 
And so also with implant, you can calculate what does this mean in terms of, of people getting salaries and wages uh, in that work. Again, over the 26 years that the data was there, it's averaged about $23 million a year in people getting paychecks over the last decade, about $35 million a year. But here was another one that, that I looked at and I thought significant, particularly in a place like Iowa. I took several data points of implant over this 26 years. And back at the beginning, in 86, every job that was created by rehabilitation in these, in these towns, that created a job, that job paid about uh, 15000 a year. Now, keep in mind, you know, somebody's getting minimum wage and somebody's getting 40000 but that was the average, if you just take numbers of jobs and the number of income, that was the amount of income per job. By last year, that reached $36,000. Meaning that these are not just jobs, these are good jobs. And they're jobs, you know, people talk about living wage jobs, this is what they're talking about. And, and these are jobs particularly good for people without advanced formal education. Now, you can kind of look at, at here where the curve is kind of flattened out. Well, think about your own paycheck for the last 10 years. I mean, you haven't gotten big, most of you haven't gotten big jumps in income because the whole economy is kind of flattened out in terms of, of um, on the wage side of the spectrum. That's just reflecting that. But the point is, is that here we have a job that's paying lots more uh, than it did at the beginning of this process. One of the possibilities that a skeptic, and I love skeptics about this, and I hope you or some viewers who can raise some issues that I haven't thought of, but what somebody might say, well, yeah, you're looking at all this stuff, these increasing growth curves, but there's been inflation. Maybe it's just inflation driven. So I said, that's at least a good question to ask. So here was, uh, the, on an index basis, here was the inflation in, in the United States. And what an index basis means, year one is kind of the base, and you just call that 100. And then if inflation is 1% that year, then the next year's index is 101. Here is the activity in investment in, in Iowa Main Street community. It had nothing to do with inflation. It had another little tiny little sliver here we can account for inflation. The rest is, the rest is real, uh, substantive uh, investment. You all know that we've had a you know, real estate recession, and I, don't, I think they've defined it wrong. I think it's been going on and never ended since it started in the end of 2007. And here's how that has particularly affected the construction industry all over the country and including here in Iowa. So this line is the construction activity in the state of Iowa. And what you can see is here 2011, it's even a little less than it was in 2006. 2006 the base year, 2007 is when chaos began. So you can see what's happening. Again, this is nothing about against Iowa. Many states are much worse than this. It's kind of the national is that there just hasn't been much activity. It's kind of flat line. This is the activity in uh, construction activity in Iowa Main Street communities. That here, and again, uh, an index, this, this is, this is uh, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600. This means, up here, this is means there was six times as much activity in 2009 as there was in 2006. And don't worry about this decline curve, it's just kind of how projects are going. It's still, and I'm sorry, that, screen isn't picking that up, but it's still three times as much as it was at the beginning. So, so in, spite, in spite of this national chaos in construction activity, Main Street's been against the trend. Now, in fairness, some of that has been the result of building owners, property owners in those communities taking advantage of some very good programs that the state of Iowa, the state Main Street program that the federal government has been tapped into, so the challenge grants, the iJobs programs, and others are account for some of this. No question about it, that they were kind of a spur to investment that otherwise wouldn't have taken place. But the fact is, the Main Street communities, property owners said, yeah, in spite of the national economy, I'm leaping forward, and they've made that difference. And then finally, this, this issue that it was one of the more surprising because I didn't have a sufficiently nuanced view of what's happening in Iowa today. This uh, welcoming uh, new Iowans in these Main Street communities. Here's the, the rural, the, the, the 20 or 22 rural Main Street programs. And they have they gained between 2000 and 2010 1.2%. Now that doesn't seem a lot, of, a lot of population gain, but you know, many of them have been declining in population for 40 years. Thrilled. Here's what happened to the Hispanic 
population those things. Up 139%, 140%. This isn't Des Moines or Dubuque or Sioux City. This is coming under 5,000 people at 139% growth. And I don't mean to culturally stereotype. I know that a bunch of those Hispanic workers go to those towns because there's a poultry plot processing plant at the edge of town or something like that. I understand that. But what happens <coughs> is that it's also a very entrepreneurial culture. So some one of those guys can say, I'm going to quit you know, picking feathers off chickens. I'm going to go up and I'm going to open a store in town. And that's what happens. It's happening in many of these mainstream communities absolutely grasping on that. In the, in the Main Street, traditional Main Street communities, that growth is 108%, meaning it doubled in the decade, doubled the, the Hispanic population in those Main Street communities. That's an extraordinary opportunity in many of these places that we really understanding the nuances of that. <clears throat> so where are the economic impacts? The jobs, it's in businesses, in real estate investments, in sales and property taxes, economic opportunity, it's community commitment, and a whole lot of things. So it's an extraordinarily, extraordinarily successful, apart from the preservation positive, it's an economic development tool. Main Street Hour has been extraordinarily successful. So thank you all very much. I'll be happy to take whatever questions you have.